الحمد للہ وقفا وسلا اما بعد فقد قال اللہ سبحان القرآن المجید والفرقان الحمید اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان کن تم فی ریب مما نزلنا على عبدنا فاعتو بسورة من مثله صدق اللہ العلی العظیم My dear brothers and sisters and my children, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Dear brothers and sisters, uh, Islam requires us, Islam obliges us, obliges us to have certainty. We must be certain in our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must be certain about the prophethood of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We, my dear brothers and sisters, must be certain that the Qur'an is Kalamullah, that the Qur'an is the word of God. Islam requires us to have certainty for all these, our belief systems and aqaid. But what is certainty? How do we arrive how do we achieve this certainty? What is, I mean, how do we get this certainty? <coughs> Islam requires us to be certain in believing in God. Islam requires us to be certain in believing in God. Uh, brother, can you just sit there? Uh, Islam requires us to be certain in, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It requires us to be certain in the Prophet of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it requires us to be certain in the, that the Qur'an is Kalamullah but how do we get this certainty? How do we achieve this Yaqeen? So my dear brothers and sisters certainty is arrived at through <coughs> our faculty of reasoning. We arrive at certainty through understanding. So how do we, how can we get certain about things? We can be certain through the process of reasoning, through our intellect, through our akal. So that gives us certainty. It's, it's akal, it's reasoning, <coughs> it's faculty of reasoning that provides us with yaqeen, provides us with certainty. I hope you're following me so far. Islam requires certainty. Certainty is acquired from our faculty of reasoning. We've got to that much so far. So, when we employ this reason, when we employ this yaqeen, when we use this process of reasoning, we study and observe life, what do we see? When we study and observe our life, the life of human beings, the external world, when we look at it, when we study it, what do we see? What happens? We find that this world, there's nothing in this world is eternal. Eternal means which, that which does not have a beginning and an end time. So we look at this world and we say, there is nothing in this world which is eternal. And nothing in this world is self-subsistent. We study the universe, we study the world that rather, we look at it and we find that nothing is self-subsistent. Nothing is eternal and every, nothing is self-subsistent. What does that mean? Which means that everything is limited and dependent. We need to eat, we need to drink, we need to sleep. We are dependent on the world outside of us. We are limited and dependent. Needy people, human beings. So, limited and dependent things cannot cause themselves. We cannot create ourselves, cause ourselves, because we are limited and dependent. So this sort of begs the question, that what has caused this world? What has caused us? Everything around us is temporal. Everything around us has beginning and end in time. Everything perishes. Everything is needy. Everything is limited. 
Everything is dependent. So, what caused it? Where has all this come from? This is the question. Now, obviously, things cannot cause themselves. They need somebody, something to cause them, right? Because they're limited. Now, if, therefore, we need a creator who has created all this world. So, what is the definition of a creator now? The creator must be separable and totally different from the creation, okay? Because if the creator is the same as us, limited and dependent, then this creator it will in turn need another creator and add infinitum. Yes? So, so this creator it has to be totally separable and totally different from, from us human beings. Um, so, so this is, this is uh, what's going on. Well, please sit down. So this is the thing. So the creator has to be totally separable and different uh, from, from the creation, right? Now this argument may be slightly a bit tough uh, for, you, for you to understand. Before I come and address the children, um, let me just give you, because uh, some educated brothers are here, let me just give you another example. You know, in, since the 1990s, in philosophy, my dear brothers and sisters, there is this argument called the fine-tuning argument, right? Now, what is this argument about? That, you know, there's this theory of Big Bang. Uh, what is the Big Bang theory? It's basically about the, the origin of the universe as it is today. The origin of the universe. And it, it, it's, it kind of says, if I can remember correctly, that, you know, this, this universe... Uh, be, just pay attention over here, everybody, right? So, this universe is, uh, at one point, there was just matter, <coughs> dense matter, with really extremely high temperature or something like that, really dense matter. And what happened, that there was this explosion, or this, this reaction, and then <coughs> the universe rapidly, this big bang happened, Matter was dense and this big bang happened and the universe started to expand rapidly at a great speed. And after the big bang, this, 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 this exp as the universe is expanding infinitely in space, time and space. So what happened was that this is the moment, yes, when the universe uh, was given birth to as it is today. The origin of the universe is, uh, is from the Big Bang, right? Now, the Big Bang, there are so many galaxies. This universe in itself is infinite, in, you know, according to the modern science, virtually infinite in time and space. So, life is only possible, for example, as far as we know today, is on the planet Earth, right? Now, for life to be possible after the Big Bang, there had to be so many factors, so many things precisely in the right position for life to exist as it is today. Right? There are electromagnetic forces, there are gravitational forces. For example, the balance between electrons and protons had to be 10 to the power of 37. That's one with 37 zeros. The balance had to be precisely 10 to the 37. You know, the, 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 the other forces, you know, I've read the 10 to 55, 10 to the power of 59. So, you know, the, the, the expansion of the universe. If it's any faster or any slower, the universe will collapse. There's no life, right? Uh, there is, if, if we are like 1% away from the sun, everything will freeze on earth and if we are one percent closer to the to the to the to the sun we will uh, everything will, with water would vaporize and there are so many factors you know like um all these forces and there's great number of forces according to the scientists <coughs> not me i'm not a scientist according to the scientists there are so many factors 
They had to be absolutely precise. 10 to the power of 37, 10 to the power of 59. These are real numbers. 10 to the power of 57, 59, 40, and so on. I've read all those things. Um, and so <coughs> when you put a 1 there, and then you put 50 zeros next to it, you know how big that number is. And you have to, the ratio has to be that precisely at that point, right? So this the argument called the fine-tuning argument. The argument that the life to exist, the universe at the, at the moment of the Big Bang, it has to have so many factors, so many factors, absolutely and 100% to the billionth of a second, to the billionth in terms of quantity, has to be precisely in the right place for life to exist as it is today. If any of this thing was either way, are you, you with me? If any of these things was either way, life as it exists today would be impossible. Okay? I give you an example, and this is for you to go on further research about the fine-tuning argument. I think Richard Swinburne is a very good writer on this subject of God. He's a philosopher. Maybe a little bit difficult for people to, to understand, but I'm just saying it for those who are interested. Anyway, uh, for example, we all know in our society, on television, we see the lottery happening, right? Every, I don't know, Friday or Saturday or whatever day, that there's lottery, there's the Euro lotteries. And then yesterday or day before, I heard on the news that in America, I think it is, some, there's a lottery prize of 600 million, you know, and then people are trying to win it. Now, imagine I play the lottery, or Mr. X, let's say Mr. X plays the lottery, which is haram in Islam, I think. Uh, I, I, the reason I said I think because this is the Darul Harab and uh, the Muftis have to tell you, but take it that it's forbidden. Lottery is, is not an Islamic practice. Um, so, I, I, Mr. X plays the lottery. <coughs> And he wins it, okay, next week, Mr. X wins the lottery, okay. What does he do? He plays the lottery again, and guess what? He wins the same lottery next week again. Then he plays the lottery, he wins it again. <coughs> then he plays, he wins it again, and again. So this person has won lottery like six, seven, eight times on the trot. Or even more. What do you think? There's something wrong here, isn't it? You, as an intelligent person, would think that there is a fix. This lottery is rigged. This is not genuine lottery where somebody wins and then once in the blue moon somebody wins and you know. But to win it, the same person winning every week is impossible. Mathematically, right? And rationally. And everybody will just, this is a thief, rigged, you know, chakkar. That's what people would say. The Big Bang and life is a million times, a million times more than that person winning the lottery of 50 times on the trot. It has, everything minutely has to be in the right place. So I'm just trying to prove the existence of God here, by the way, just, just in case if somebody is, uh, thinks what's going on here. So we use our reason, we study and observe the universe, I mean the world around us, the external world. We study and observe, we see that nothing in this world is eternal and everything is, <coughs> and nothing is self-subsistent. We can prove God by all these things. Just let me give you two more examples, because this is the most difficult sort of question. Um, uh, one more from philosophy, and one more from, inshallah, for the children, okay? Uh, this looks like it's going to be a little bit uh, longer than I anticipated, because there's lots of stuff I have to tell you, but the God is very important. Um, so anyway, my dear brothers and sisters, and my children, <laughs> I keep saying that, because my children are here. Um, so the thing is, that um, God, right? Um, you know this, look at the human beings, man. 
us humans. You know, there are life, right, is an activity, and every activity has certain problems with it, right? And the problems of life are two, the immediate problems and the ultimate problems. The immediate problems are about our family, about our jobs, about where we live, about politics, about society, all that. These are the immediate problems we face. Everybody faces them, right? We're not talking about that. There are ultimate problems. Ultimate problems meaning the problems with, the ultimate problems are the problems which uh, we face as human beings and I mean, they ask, what is the meaning and purpose of our lives? Why are we here? What are we doing here? What is the purpose of our existence? What is the reason <coughs> for which, you know, what is the meaning of our life? What is the purpose? These are the questions that deal with the ultimate questions of life, right? These are the ultimate questions. Ultimate questions, my dear brothers and sisters, are such that we ask about man, about human beings, about universe, and about God. These are the three main heads of asking about the ultimate question. Look at man, human beings, right? Look at us. We look at our situation as human beings, okay? What do we see? We see that human being, we, what are we? We are part and parcel of what? We are part, human beings are part of another larger whole. This is for Mustafa, yeah? So maybe you'll understand. Human beings and individual, we are part of a larger category of human race, right? Human race, in its turn, is part and parcel of a larger whole. Right? Which is the organic world. Okay? Which includes the plants. Okay? The organic world, in its turn, is part of this earth, with both, which includes both organic and inorganic world. So man is part of the human race, human race is part of the organic world. Organic world plus <coughs> inorganic world make us the part of this earth. So each time, we are part of a larger whole. Larger whole. Right? The earth is part of what? Part of our solar system. Right? Our solar system in its turn is part and parcel of its galaxy with untold you know, number of stars in it. Right? So man is part of the human race. Human race is part of this earth. Earth is part of the solar system. Solar system is part of this galaxy. And the galaxy in its turn, my dear brothers and sisters, is part of this universe, which is, according to science, virtually infinite in time and space. Okay? There's a basic rule of logic. It's very easy. That to know the destiny, to know the function, to know the purpose, and to know the constitution of the part we must know the destiny, the purpose, the function, and the constitution of the whole. This logic and this <coughs> argument, I believe that you may have not heard this one before. You know. So, part only makes sense when you know the whole. But the universe is, as a whole is unknowable for us. We don't know about the universe in, in its entirety. No scientist can ever claim to be so. No one. <coughs> so to know the function and destiny and purpose of as a human being of us, logically we must know the destiny of the whole of which we are part. Can anyone claim to tell us the destiny of the whole or the purpose of the whole or the constitution of the whole? Because we depend, we are part of this larger whole, okay? So that's why also it necessitates the existence of God in the sense that when the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell you that we know the whole. <coughs> because the philosophers have never made claim. Socrates says, I know this, that I know nothing. You know? And you have lots of philosophers admitting to the, and the scientists admitting to the fact that they don't know the whole. The only people 
in the history of mankind who have claimed that they know the whole because they have been informed by God are the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So logically it makes sense for us to follow the ones who have the knowledge of the whole than the ones who have the partial knowledge. I mean, you know, take three blind people from birth, take them into this big hall, Natural History Museum or something, and then you've got, take them to a Natural History Museum, uh, and you take them there, and then you ask them, um, yeah, you ask them, uh, uh, to t they're blind, so there's an elephant in the room, so you ask them to feel the elephant and tell us, uh, sit there. You asked uh, us to feel this elephant that, uh, you know, what does this elephant look like? So, these three blind people, yeah, these three blind people go and they, uh, these three blind, so they are all blind and they touch the legs of the elephant partially and then one that touches the trunk and the one touches the, the ears or the back of it. These three blind people, when you take them out and say, okay, what does this animal look like? They will say, oh, Oh, it looks like a pillar, a column, because he's only touched the legs when he doesn't. I have an idea of never seen an elephant. The other person who touches the, the 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 ears of the elephant thinks that this elephant is like a fan. The one that touches the back of the elephant, he thinks, oh, this is a kind of a flat animal. So it's the same elephant, right? But the conclusion of these three blind men are different. Because they don't have the whole truth. They only have the partial truth. Same as this world and our function and so on. You know, uh, just to address my younger ones. Um, uh, this, is, this is a huge, uh, I think it's going to take long. But I, I must address you. You know, there was a Jaffi. There was a, a nomad in the deserts of Arabia, okay. And he did not believe in God. He says, oh, I don't believe in God. No such thing as God, you know, it's all chance, it's all just luck of <coughs> the draw, you know, it's all, uh, you know, it's, it's just throwing like a dice, whatever comes off, it happens and so on, right? So this nomad in the deserts of Arabia was traveling and he was going through the desert and, you know, he was like the first man on the moon kind of thing. Because the Sahara Desert is huge. And if you travel through the Sahara Desert, you could go for five days, ten days, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And you could, this guy was <coughs> traveling far because, you know, to survive in the desert, you need water. You know, you need food and water to survive in the desert, right? So this guy goes in the desert and, and he comes as far as, and he, he thinks, well, two weeks, three weeks came so far and he goes, I must be the only man, pay attention over here, he says, I am the only man to come this far into the desert. No one has ever come this far, I am the, the only one. And he was really proud and he was really arrogant about his, you know, he's really, he says, I am the only one. And remember, this guy did not believe in God in the first place, right? So. He is proud of the fact that he is the only one to come this far into the desert and no man has ever set foot on the desert, this part of the desert before me. Because it's so difficult, three, four weeks, you know, you have to have supplies, water, you have to be a, have, you've got to be a master traveler for you to be able to do that. So anyway, with this thought in his mind, he's crossing over a dune. And as soon as he lands on the other side of the dune, he sees that there were camel droppings. You know, camel poo, excuse me. He sees that there are camel droppings on the sand. And he also sees there are footprints from another traveler who's been there before him. And he goes, wow. At this moment, the idea of God hits his spirit. And he was a poet and he impromptu, spontaneously, he said, The Al Ba'aratu Tadullo ala al Ba'ir, Wa Atharul Qadame ala al Mathir, Fas Sama'u Dhatu Abrajin, 
والبحار ذات أمواج والأرض ذات فجاج كيف لا تدل على السميع البصير He says the camel droppings point to the existence of a camel The footprints on the sand tell of a traveler The heavens with their stars The earth with its mountains and valleys The sea with its waves Don't they point to an all-hearing and all-seeing and omniscient and omnipotent creator? Of course they do. And this guy, by this just little incident in his life, believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Know this, my dear brothers and sisters and my children, know this, that from a grain of sand to the desert, from a star to the galaxy, From a flower to the garden, and from a <coughs> drop to the ocean, everything points to the existence of an all-wise, intelligent, and powerful creator of this universe. So, so far, my dear brothers and sisters and my children, <coughs> we have discussed the idea of God, that Islam requires us to be certain, Islam requires us to be certain in our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It requires us to have certainty in the belief in Allah, certainty in the belief in the Prophet Muhammad <coughs> and certainty that the Quran is Kalamullah. So far we have discussed the idea of God in so many different terms. I hope you understand that there's so much more to it, but I think this is, is, is alhamdulillah sufficient. There may be things for everybody in it. Now moving on. And this is the main part of this whole class. What I've just said to you is just um, uh, something that, you know, I thought we need to know. We have, um, inshallah, I will try to, 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 to make this lesson, because this is the only lesson that will be put online. All other lessons in this class that we will have, they will not, they will be just for this class, but this is the only one that's been recorded. So that's why I really have to explain a few things. Are you all okay here? Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. Um, so, so we know the Creator, okay? We can tell from our reason that there is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is Creator. But what we can't tell from these evidences is what does God want from us? Right? We know from reason, when we study, we observe, you know, through science, through observation, through all these reasons, we can see that there is an intelligent design behind all this and we can come to this conclusion. Certainly, you know, it's certainly we said that there's God, but what does God want from us? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us for? What is the purpose <coughs> of our, what is the meaning of our life? What is the purpose of our creation. Now that, you cannot arrive at the answer of this question through the process of reasoning. Through, you know, study and observing the universe and coming to as a conclusion, that ah, oh, we are created for this reason. We know there's a creator, but why? That's something we cannot arrive at on our own. For that, We need to be told. We need to be communicated this reason of this creation. Okay? Do you understand what's going on? So, how do we know what does Allah Ta'ala want from us? We know He exists, but what does God want from us? This has to be communicated to us. This has to be told. <coughs> so, how... So what are the options here now? We only have two options, right? Either we communicate with the Creator or the Creator communicates with us. What are the two options we have of making contact? Either we make contact with God or God makes contact with us. How can we, as limited and dependent beings, make contact with God? Imagine if a Chinese man comes in our place, he speaks Mandarin, 
I don't speak Mandarin. He speaks some dialect of <coughs> Shaolin Temple or something Chinese. I don't know this Chinese. You know, I, I can remember I used to be watching the dubbed Shaolin Temple Kung Fu movies. It was a wonderful time. But anyways, um, so I can't speak Chinese. This is my dear brother or friend. He speaks Chinese. How do we communicate? He, I, we, we, we have two different languages. How can we, we don't even, we can't even communicate with each other <coughs> properly if we speak two different <coughs> languages. So how can the limited and dependent communicate with God? So this communication has to come from God. This communication has to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> it is for this reason, my dear brothers and sisters and children, it is for this reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates to humanity through his prophets. Yes? So this reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes contact with us, he communicates with humanity <coughs> through the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who come and tell us the purpose and meaning of our life, how to live our life, that there is a life after death, and then you know we will die, but we you know we will live again. This all these things is the prophets Allah Ta'ala sent to tell us about uh, the meaning and purpose of our life. So naturally, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his prophets to all nations, all tribes, all people in the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent uh, uh, you know his prophets to each and every tribe, to each and every nation on this you know, for every nation there is a guide. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. Right? And maybe people living in the Amazon forest. Allah Ta'ala in thousands of years ago sent guidance to them. People living in, in the Sahara Desert, Allah Ta'ala sent prophets to them. People living in the jungles of Africa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. So every nation, the only difference was that these prophets were limited to their own time and their own place. So Allah Ta'ala sent His Prophets. Yes, please pay attention over here. Allah Ta'ala sent His Prophets. These Prophets came to the people and they told the people, they, they asked the people that we are from Allah, we are the Prophets of God, we bring the news to you, the Ya Ayyuhannah, Ya Ayyuhannas, Ulu La Ilaha Illallah Tuflihu that we call you that they believe in one God and then you will succeed. So when the prophets gave their message to the people, obviously, people, you know, the, the, some people who straight away, because they, they believed in them, but there's a large number of people who <coughs> were skeptics. They were doubters. They said, why should we believe in you? Huh? Why you, you, why you prophet God? What's this scam? Why should we believe in you? They were skeptics. They are doubts because we don't believe in you, brethren. So now, the prophets came to communicate to us the meaning and purpose of our life. And when these prophets, when they communicated to the people, the people amongst these people, there were people who were skeptics. Doubters. Who did not believe in their message. So what happened now then? What, are, what is the Prophet to do now? So this reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave His Prophets miracles. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave miracles to these Prophets to convince the skeptics. To convince these people who doubted their authenticity. So when the prophets came, they told people, people required, said, no, we don't believe you, show us miracles. They showed them miracles, okay? The prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed these people physical, tangible, transitory miracles. <coughs> miracles that were physical. <coughs> so for example, I'll give you an example. Hazrat Salih alayhi salam. Hazrat Salih alayhi salam was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and he called people to God. <coughs> and eventually the people said, Okay, you think you are the true prophet of God? 
this is a rock, create a camel out of this rock. <coughs> a rock is an inanimate object, a lifeless piece of rock. They said, make a, a living, walking, breathing, eating, drinking camel. Out of an inanimate object, make an animate object. So what did Hazrat Salih alayhi salam do? With the permission of God, with the powers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given to him, he created out of a rock a living, moving, eating, drinking, walking camel to convince his people. Times of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, he was given many miracles. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam to convince his people in the courts of Pharaoh. Ramses the second, I think, in the courts of Pharaoh. There was lots and lots of magicians. You know, there was illusionists that Pharaoh had in his court, lots of illusionists. You know, people that make you believe that this is, but it's an illusion. This doesn't really happen truly, but it's an illusion they create. So there was a big competition. Hundreds and hundreds of magicians came, thousands and thousands of people watching. There's a whole World Cup kind of an event taking place. These magicians are throwing ropes on the floor and the ropes were looking like snakes. People were running away from it. This is magic. Then the Prophet of Allah, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, he used to, he had a staff, a stick. And all these, they, they tried to scare Moses in the course of Pharaoh by making lots of little snakes and big ones and small ones to it. And Moses was the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With the Izzan of Allah, he goes, okay, here you go. And he threw his stick and the stick turned into a snake, a big, big python stuff, big massive one, right? So this snake, not only, this snake was actually not just content in being a snake, he went and swallowed all the other ones made in competition to it. The point is that the first people to believe in Hazrat Moses were the magicians themselves because they could see that what we were doing is illusion but what he's doing is real. So this is the, one of the miracles that the Moses salam, did to convince his people. After Moses, Ibrahim salam, for example, Prophet Ibrahim, Nimrod, <coughs> Namrud, in competition to Prophet Ibrahim salam, he was preaching the word of God, they didn't like it, so Namrud, they prepared this huge pit of fire, massive one, burned for so many days, huge pit of fire, and they ceremoniously got together, you know, to demonstrate to the whole public, and they threw Hazrat Ibrahim salam, into this fire, this hot, burning, whoa, burning fire, threw Hazrat Ibrahim salam, into it. And as Abdul Ibrahim salam, was falling into the fire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the fire. It says, Ya narukuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. So, oh fire, become comfort, become cool for Ibrahim. So what happened here? That the nature of fire was changed was stripped of its nature. Fire burns, man. But it didn't burn Hazrat Ibrahim <coughs> This is his miracle. Before I actually go back to the next example, there's one thing I overlooked here. What is a miracle? The definition of a miracle, my dear brothers and sisters, generally speaking, a, a miracle is that which defies, transgresses, and violates the laws of nature. What is the law of nature? For example, gravity. I take a brick, I throw it up, what happens? It comes back. The laws of nature is that they pulls back the, the, these objects. Right? So a miracle is that which defies the laws of nature. It is inimitable, it's insuperable, and it's unchallengeable. Okay? So a miracle that which defies the laws of nature, and it cannot be challenged. Did you understand that, Akbar? Okay, so the miracle is, defies the laws of nature and it cannot be challenged. 
<coughs> it's in inevitable, it's insuperable. Okay? This is the definition of miracle. Sali alayhi salam defies the laws of nature. Uh, examples we gave you. Musa alayhi salam defies the laws of nature. Ibrahim alayhi salam defies the laws of nature. Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, in his time, Adat Isa alayhi salam's time, he healed the lame so they could walk. He killed the blind so they could see. He brought the dead back to life. So Isa alayhi salam was also given these miracles to justify and prove his prophethood. Okay? And now at this juncture, um, inshallah, we're going to go about 10 15 minutes over time because um, I have to conclude this discussion. So now, <coughs> you see the miracles which defies the laws of nature. And look what's happened. That all these prophets performed their miracles to prove to the people who they came to that we are the genuine and true prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These miracles, what they had in common was they are physical miracles. They were transitory <coughs> and tangible miracles. Okay? Now, one man asks, Hazrat Imam Jafar al Sadiq alayhi salam. Do you know who Imam Jafar al Sadiq alayhi salam is? <coughs> he is the sixth Imam from Ahlul Bayt. From the Imam of the household of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he is the sixth Imam. His name is Jafar ibn Muhammad al Sadiq alayhi salam. He just, I would like to actually spend just two minutes. All the four fakes of schools of thought, Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, they are all directly or indirectly the students of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. Abu Hanifa is directly student of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. All the Sufi chains, all the Sufi spiritual silsilas in Islam, all of them, not a single exception, they all go through this man, Imam Jafar Sadiq. Scientists, the Muslims were who laid the foundations of modern Europe in terms of science. The very great chemist, scientist Jabir ibn Hayyan, the father of chemistry, he was a student of Imam Jafar Sadiq. Actually, he, his Rasail, treatise, Maulana, Zufkasa, his Rasail are published. And he was student. So this one man alone, Jafar al-Sadiq, is teaching legal theory, is teaching esoteric spiritual knowledge, is teaching science, is teaching tafsir. A Shaykh al-Akbar, Hazrat Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, radiyallahu anhu, <coughs> The, the, the first man in the Islamic history to actually codify and give a systematic uh, study of tasawwuf. When he was writing his tafsir uh, of the Quran, which is esoteric tafsir, on the first page of his tafsir he says, Qala sadiqo alayhi salam. He said, Imam Jafar Sadiq said, the inna allaha tabaraka wa ta'ala Tajalla li ibadihi fil Quran. That Allah wa ta'ala unveils the mysteries of the meaning of the Quran for his servants. Because as Shaykh al Akbar wanted to do, as Shaykh al Akbar wanted to do uh, an esoteric tafsir, and he needs some justification. <coughs> and he justifies his method by appeal to Imam Jafar al Sadiq. So, this great sixth Imam of Mahal al Bayt, he was asked the question. And he goes, Ya Imam al Sadiq, why is it that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why is it that Saleh, Jesus, Moses, Ibrahim, <coughs> why all of them not, why didn't all of them have exactly the same sort of miracle, identi mir identical miracle, you know, you know, like the, the police badge or whatever. They all have the same one, LAPD, <laughs> you know? Excuse me, I'm just trying to make these children um, understand what I'm saying. So why did all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have the same type of miracle? 
this man asked Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. So Imam Jafar Sadiq replies, alayhi salam replies, he goes, look, for the maximum effect of a miracle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets performed the miracles that for maximum effect that attracted the most attention from the people. Their miracles resembled the most, you know, what they were versed in, what they were specialist in at the time. So Allah Ta'ala made the miracles according to their, according to their speciality, according to the main, you know, their own achievements. So in Hazrat Salih al-Islam, you know, if you go to Petra in Jordan, you see these palaces and houses carved out of mountains. They still exist. So these people in the Salih al-Islam's time were really proud of their carvings and how great they were with, with the rock and make store, uh, houses inside the rocks. So Hazrat Salih al-Islam got the miracle which was similar to their miracle but he here creates a, 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 a camel out of a rock which they can't do for maximum effect. Okay? Hazrat Musa <coughs> al-Islam there's a whole tradition of mag magicians. There's a whole tradition of magic, you know, illusionists. So as Musa al-Islam does a miracle which resembles magic, which is not magic, but resembles magic <coughs> for the maximum attention of people. In times of Jesus alayhi salam, for example, in his times, there was a group of physicians who could heal the incurable diseases of the time. But what did Jesus Isa alayhi salam do? He healed those diseases which they couldn't even heal. Leprosy, you know, lame, make them walk, bringing dead back to life, the ultimate miracle of medicine. So the miracles were different because the age in which they occurred were different, and each age had its main sort of focus and attention and speciality and achievement. So the miracles were given to these prophets according to the, the main attention and attraction of these people at the time. Now, finally, we are going to finish, but Finally, comes the last and final prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now comes the last messenger, the best of all the messengers, the <coughs> Rahmat al alameen the Khatam al nabi Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now comes the greatest of all. And his message is not limited to a particular tribe, to a particular nation. His message is not limited to certain place and which has time limit or space limit. This message of Islam that Hazrat Pak Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought was a universal message. It was a message for everyone until the day of judgment. This message had no time and space limits. It was the final message. So when Hazrat Pak Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, he performed many miracles. I mean. We can have another sitting on that one for physical miracles. But Hazrat Prophet's main miracle was the Quran. Quran Sharif was his main miracle, which will last until the day of judgment. The miracles of other prophets were physical miracles, tangible miracles. But where are they today? Where are those miracles today? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's miracle is the Quran. I will explain <coughs> how the Quran is a miracle. In the times of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the main direction of the thought of these people in Arabia, the main expertise they had was towards the Arabic language. They were so good in Arabic that they could express the same idea in a hundred different ways. Actually, the word Arab Mean, means who can speak, who can express himself. And Ajam, they called all the rest who were non-Arabs as Ajami. Ajam, Ajam means people who are speechless, dumb. People who have no expression. As a derogatory term in, in the time. Now it means a non-Arab. But Arab and Ajam in its original uh, connotation meant Arabs who were masters of language. And Ajam who were dumb and speechless and did not have any expression. So they were so great. And every year, um, every year, 
every year, I think we, we, we have to quickly finish. Every year, my dear brothers and sisters, there was a competition in Arabia. It's called Souk at Souk Okaz. There's a market of Okaz, right? Every year, the poets of, from all over the Arabia, all poets, they used to come and take part in poetry. Yes, Fatme? They all used to come and take part, Hassan? They all used to come and take part in poetry. So this was like a World Cup. You know the next football World Cup is in, where is that? Brazil. Brazil, okay. Olympics, we happened in here, Stratford, you know, London. Olympics. So this was kind of an Olympics or a World Cup of poetry and World Cup of Arabic language expression. It was called Souk Ukaz. So the people used to come from all over the place and compete. Thousands of people watching and they used to compete. And whoever won the competition, they will have his piece of poetry stuck on the door of the Kaaba. Remember the Kaaba existed before the Prophet ﷺ from the time of the brain. So they will stick the poetry piece on the doors of the Kaaba. Right? When they stuck these pieces of poetry on the door of the Kaaba, right? Um, and th those writings are still existent today, actually. I myself, as I studied in Darul uh, Ulum, uh, 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 the seven hung ones, ones of Kasa, have studied with me. So these seven, so what they used to do, whoever won the competition, they used to write his poetry and stick it on the door of the Kaaba until the next person ever who come and beat it with some more poetry. And when the Quran Park was revealed, right, this is what I'm trying to tell you. So the Arabic thought was that they were really good with poetry, they were very proud of it. This was the main attraction and direction of their thought at the time. Intellectually, you know, they were very much intellectually into, into, into language. So that's why Hazul Park was given a miracle, which is an intellectual miracle. <laughs> How is the Quran Park a miracle? So when all this happening, contextually, this whole thing was going on, comes Hazul Park he says, I am the Prophet of God. This is the message of Allah. It's revealed in Arabic. These Arabs who were brilliant. But what does the Quran do? This, this concept is called at tahaddi the challenge. So Huzur Pasallahu says, I am the Prophet of God. And they said, no, 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 what is your proof? And Huzur Pak reads the Quran. So poetic, you know, it's not poetic, but it's something else. It is, <coughs> these Arabs who are masters of the Arabic language, there's a whole culture about it. They heard it, goes, whoa, where have you got that? You must have forged this. Oh, this is magic. <laughs> They used to say that, oh, Prophet Sallallahu oh, some magic has been happened on this man. You know, I'm really, Mustafa, I, it begs my belief that on one side the Quran is saying that the Kufar are saying that the magic has affected the Prophet. Otherwise, we are making a hadith and say, yeah, the magic <coughs> affected the Prophet. This is totally nonsense. That's why Imam Abu Bakr al-Jassas totally denies that any magic of any kind affected the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> or his mind. <coughs> It doesn't matter which hadith book the hadith is in, it contradicts the Quran according to Imam Abu Bakr al Jassas al Hanafi, the classic Imam. But anyway, that's not my subject. So the Prophet, so they were saying all these things to the Prophet. Hazur Pak sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah Ta'ala says, Do you think that this is not, I'm finishing here, if you think this is not the book of God, yes, then bring in Surah. Uh, Surah Isra, Ban Israel. Yes? In it, I think the verse number is 88. Allah Ta'ala says, If you think this is not the book of God, then bring a book like the Quran. <coughs> this is an open <coughs> challenge. They couldn't do it. Then, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala lowers the challenge in Surah Hud, verse number 13. If you think this is not the book of God, then bring Asha. 10. Ten surah like the, that of the Quran. Ten chapters like that of the Quran. What do you do with these poets who are holding World Cups, who are writing poetry, they are proud of the fact that they are the best linguists and poets and Arabic writers. 
And the Quran says, all of you get together. Jinn, humans, all of you get together and start writing like the book, like the Quran. They can't do it. And Allah Ta'ala says, no, okay, bring 10 surahs, chapters like that of the Quran. <coughs> Nothing. They can't do it. Then finally, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, until the day of judgment, tells humanity, those who are skeptics and doubters about the Prophet of Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not the physical miracles that finished with the other prophets. This miracle is continued until Qiyamah. Allah Ta'ala says, إِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَعْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِسْلِهِ That if you think this is not revealed by Allah, this is not the book of God, this Muhammad is, is not the prophet of God, فَعْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِسْلِهِ then bring a single chapter like that of the Quran. You know, the smallest chapter of the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, is 10 words. <laughs> 10 words. Smallest surah in the Quran. Allah Ta'ala says, Fatu bi suratul mimisli. Bring a single chapter like that of the Quran. In the world today, there are millions of Arabic speaking people <coughs> who are not Muslims. They write books in Arabic. They are experts in Arabic. They speak Arabic. They are masters of Arabic language who written dictionaries, who are experts in all linguistic aspects, morphology, syntax. Eloquence, they are masters of it. There are universities <coughs> about it. And yet we find on TV and radio and newspapers, oh, Muslims are bad, they are this, they do this, they are terrorists, they don't treat the women, and all this stereotypical thing. I'm not talking about the just people, I'm, <coughs> even they are non Muslims. I'm talking about these extremist agenda on one side. Just like we have our extremist crazy nutcases, there are also extremists on the other side. So Islam is not blah blah blah. There's only one thing for everybody to do. Simple thing. Bring a single surah like that of the Quran. Quran, make one. Ten words. Finish the Muslims off. Forever. Our message will be forged. Our message will be not true. The message of Muhammad Mustafa will not be true. This is the challenge of the Quran. This is proves the authenticity of the Prophet <coughs> Look, you can say, oh, you do this, you, you, your justice is wrong, your this is wrong, fine, okay. You millions speak, billions of dollars, billions, they all together and write ten words like that of the Quran. That's the challenge. Then the Quran will be proven wrong. Okay? So Fatu. And you know sometimes, uh, brothers of Fakara and Mustafa, Sometimes, you know, I wonder that the, the verse, Surah al is says, it says, it's the minimum challenge of the Quran, right? Surah al kawthar says, in the Atain, our Prophet, we have given you kawthar. Kawthar means, uh, uh, you know, kawthar. Uh, uh, read, pray to Allah and do sacrifice. In the Shania Kahoval Abdar, and indeed, the. Uh, the insulter, your insulter, the person who has insulted you, who has said bad things, he will be the one without offspring, without children. Right? So, Allah Ta'ala says, the ulama have said al kawthar means many things. al kawthar means the, the river Nahar in Jannah, it means the house, the pond in Kawthar, it means many things. Imam Razi and Imam Al Naysapuri, for example, in the Bible Quran, and they say one of the opinions is that Al Kawthar means Fatima Zahra Salamullah Aleha. Why does it mean the Fatima Zahra Salamullah Aleha? Because the Inna Ataina Kal Kawthar, we have indeed given you Kawthar, and then pray and do sacrifice. Inna Shania Ka Hualabtar. Your insulter is the one with the offspring. So what these mushrikeen you people used to say to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? They used to say, "Oh, he's got no children. He's because they believe the male children, you know." 
So he's got no, he will not have any descendants, he will not have any offspring, he will have nothing. Look at it, that's they used to insult him. Allah Ta'ala says, stop it. If we have given him Kawsar, we have given him Fatima. In the Shania Kawarat, indeed, yo, the insulter will be disconnected, will not have his, uh, will not have offspring. Aptar means the person without children. The Ruzu Pak says that my offspring will continue from my daughter Fatima. So it just sometimes, Aptar is an indication, it's Karina there, tells you that Kawsar means Fatima. Now the thing is, it what makes me wonder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges humanity, tells humanity that bring a surah like that of the Quran, and the smallest surah is about Fatima salamullah You know, so this is the thing. So here we have completed our lecture today, um, that uh, we, we talked about God, we talked about the, the existence of God, we talked about the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how they perform miracles, and that there are two types of miracles, the physical, tangible miracles and intellectual miracles. The Prophet before Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given tangible and uh, physical miracles where the Hazrat Pak Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given intellectual as well as spiritual miracles because that message was until the Day of Judgment. And the Quran challenges humanity that if you think this is not the Book of God, then bring a surah like it. I really wanted to speak about the miracles, uh, how David Hume's criticism of miracles and there are really beautiful reply to that. Simple thing I can say that David Hume said that you cannot prove miracles because uh, they go against the uniform evidence of humanity. Laws of nature are witnessed by six billion people, okay? They exist. But if two, three, ten people are trying to say that, look, we saw this uh, laws of nature being defied, then he goes, the evidence against it is far greater than the evidence for it. Ten people on one side and six billion on the other side saying the laws of nature don't break. And you have five people claiming that it breaks. He goes, it doesn't make sense because the laws of nature cannot be broken. This is a very powerful argument. Yeah, this is a very powerful argument. Okay? Because you know how to prove it, you know. But here I say to, to the empiricist philosophers, it is not a claim like the other miracles. This is, you can scientifically, six billion people can see it. Six billion people can experience it. This is the miracle of the Quran. It's not that it's breaking the laws of nature. It's right in front of you. It's not that some a man started flying and we can't witness it anymore and say, oh, you know, we can just see reports. The Quran is empirically available. For everybody to see, read, and see, and then uh, refute. So it's not something that's not available. So hence the argument by David Hume, which is a very powerful argument, it doesn't really count in the sense that the other miracles are kind of hidden from everybody. But this one is not. Quran is available, you, you know, um, uh, with our senses, with our experience. So we can see it. So anyway, so this was about the justification of Islam. There's so many things, as, as it always is the case, that I missed out. But the general message, I, I'm sure, that you've got for today's class. This is our last and final class uh, that you will see on YouTube or something. Uh, that's it. Next week, I expect all of you to be here, inshallah, and we will carry on with our Islamic studies class. Wa <coughs> alhamdulillah